Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. I appreciate it as always. Well, uh, I've got about 300 slides to go through with you today. That I'm really looking forward. I'm just kidding. We have no slides today. Uh, uh, so uh, apologize if I'm a little out of breath. I actually got to find out what Huntsville traffic is like when you're running a little bit behind and everybody's coming to a 12:30 class. So um, I ran from the parking garage to get up here, but I always like to start. Uh, I really liked hearing, you know, what being a Bearcat's about. Uh, so I graduated with two degrees, as uh, Dr. Solomon said, uh, a little bit ago, I guess I'd say, or a little bit longer than a little bit ago. Um, but uh, Sam Houston has been very good to me. And as part of it being good to me, I like to try and give back to the students, to the faculty, to the College of Business overall, and to the university. And, uh, you know, to start with, I guess, uh, how many of you would claim yourselves to be proud Bearcats? There was not a lot of enthusiastic, you know, I mean, yeah. Um, well, how many of you go to football games? How many of you don't go to football games? Oh, go to football games. When I was here, we stunk. We were terrible and we're awesome. We've been great for years. Anybody on the football team or play on any sports? No? All right. Well, um, well I, wanted to, I wanted to start off with... Uh, those that you go to the football games or basketball games or any of the others will know this, but I'm going to say something and I want you to say something back to me. Sam. Houston. We can do better than that. Sam. Houston. Sam. Houston. Sam. Houston. Sam. Houston. There you go. I like it. All right. So, uh, so why do I do that? I, I start off every, every one of these classes like that. Everyone in this room is capable of doing whatever you want with your career. If you'll focus on your education, you work hard, and you also look at how you can better yourself throughout your career. It's not, what you learn in this classroom, what you learn in any of your classes, it's gonna be important in your academic or your collegiate and your uh, professional career, but what you learn after it's gonna be more key. So the, key, the biggest attribute that you have to take from this program is the basics and a willingness and a license to learn more because that's what it's all about. I, I'm gonna tell you, I've learned an immense amount of things since I left the program. Without the quality foundation that Sam Houston gave me, I wouldn't have been ready to embrace. But keep in mind that this is a license to learn when you get this degree. So anyway, well, I'm glad to be here and talk to you guys about supply chain today. And I guess I'll start with, who's ambitious here and wants to try and draw out a supply chain for me? Oh boy, this is going to be a shy group. I'm going to pick somebody if they, you know. So, who wants to come up here and draw a supply chain? Tell me what a supply chain is. You've been in this class now for a couple of months. Somebody come up here. Who has the guts? Oh, here we go. All right, here we go. What's your name? Andres. Andres. Oh, thank you, Andres. All right, come on, draw me a supply chain. You pick it. We'll 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 build it out from there. Okay. Lots of handwriting. Um, then would be your first set of food pliers. Yep. Which then you could say the manufacturing process, so the plants. Um, and you're saying this is water in this case, like, right? Oh, yeah, water bottling company. Okay, all right. Um, now these people get stuff from. Other suppliers, so say labels and plastic, and then they send out to their distributors. So say Kroger and Walmart. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just like there's stuff that goes this way, there's also stuff that goes this way. Nice. What goes that way? So return. So information. What kind of information? So health. Including me. And I think something else was that. Yeah, money. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's very good. Uh, that's one of the better ones I've seen. Good job. Yeah, yes. Anybody think we're missing anything in this? Customers. I like it. You have your customers here. So if you have your customers, what is your sales group trying to do? What, some of this information that goes back, you had demand, so I assume they're meaning demand plans, right? So the sales organization or the end customer at this point within this supply chain, not the final customer, has to try and, how much water do I need? How do I ensure that I have enough supply to meet the demands of my customer? So they'll do a demand plan. And what happens if they overshoot that demand plan? They could be overstocked. They, could run, they may not be stocking things that are making them money. If there's obsolescence or not so much water, but if there's a shelf life of some of these products, so if it was bread, if we use that as an example, there's huge implications of cost within that context, right? So, uh, so we've got demand plans. What is this, when they know what they wanna buy, they may share their demand plan back this way, which they should. Uh, they also turn that into a supply plan. Like here, they'll say, ooh, if that demand is that high, I'm gonna need this many plastic bottles, this many labels, this many, all, they have to start to extrapolate that out into a supply plan. And then ultimately, what is sent to the supplier here in order to consummate what they're going to buy. There's no wrong answers. There are lots of wrong answers, but I just got to get people talking. What, what, what's a guess? What do you send in order to say, I want to buy something, I'm going to send you this? A purchase order, right? And so you send a purchase order, and as part of this, you'd have your PO going to the supplier, the supplier providing the product and you get a goods receipt and then the manufacturer getting then an invoice to match that and so you get a three-way match and, and you go through that. So this is a very easy rudimentary supply chain but the biggest piece I'd tell you, particularly for new grads on a supply chain program, what do you think the entry level, how many of you want to do supply chain or operations as a career? Perhaps. At least for, all right. So what do you think the entry-level roles are in supply chain? Junior buyer. Junior buyer that's, a real, that's true. A buyer, very good entry-level role. What's another one? Analysts. There are a lot of analytical. I'm so glad you said I grew up an analyst. I started as an analyst. So uh, that's near and dear to my heart. Any others? You guys touched on it here. What's the front of this word or the back end of that word? Demand plan, a planner. So you have within a supply chain, you're going to have demand planners that are capturing the sales cycle. You're going to have supply planners that are turning that into what are the components that we need in order to meet that demand plan. And then you're going to have production planners in the manufacturing process, uh, transportation planners or logistics planners to help get it to the end customer or distribution points or manage inbound shipments. Planning is another excellent entry point, but it's also one of the biggest components. So we talked about analytics, we talked about junior buyers, we talked about planning. If you don't have good planning, do you think that's more impactful than not having a good contract or a good price point or less impactful? It's probably more impactful because if you buy things that you don't need or you don't buy enough of what you do need, people are either not going to get fulfillment in the demand that they're asking for or they're going to go somewhere else for that product. You may lose customers. You may have obsolescence and write-offs. You know, so you have inventory that you ultimately can't sell or you have to discount so this happens with clothing manufacturers a lot. How many of you go to the discount rack at any of these uh, uh, retail shops, right? I mean, that, that they overordered something or they overordered a size. You know, what's the demographics of the customer that they're buying for? Those are all part of the planning process that you have to understand. And the better you get at it, there's all kinds of software out there to help you, but there's, there's so, still a lot of 
manual interaction and a knowledge of the customer base that ultimately has to be known. So planning and demand planning and all that is good. So what's been the most intriguing aspect of what you've learned about supply chain this semester thus far? Yeah, how many people have to be involved in that? So there's a, there's a common uh, misconception that supply chain is a functional discipline in and of itself, almost like a silo. So you see these are kind of like silos and you have supply chain here. And you might have procurement and you planning and manufacturing and in some cases operations in there, um, transportation and logistics. Um, but that's not all-encompassing supply chain. That's kind of who owns the supply chain relationships to get the inputs that are needed. You also have sales. You have R&D. You have marketing. You have finance. And if it's outside of the realm, operations, for example. So when you have all those components, you're really trying to be a conduit into all the aspects there because how much do you think marketing, any marketing majors in here? Oh wow, a lot of marketing majors. This is a good class for marketing, by the way, because the better you can get at supply chain, the better you're gonna be able to support your organizations. What are the implications with what you've learned in marketing so far? A good marketing arm, what does that mean? for the overall profitability? What, what's one of the aspects that would really impact supply chain and overall profitability in marketing? You increase sales. Increase sales. You absolutely want to increase sales. So in, in conjunction with the sales organization, you're going to want to do that for sure. But um, do you want a lot of products, a lower number of products, somewhere in between? What's the right product mix? Anybody have any insights that you've gotten in your marketing classes around product mix? You diversify too much, then you can actually go down. You're absolutely right. So you think about, I, I'll, my, the last company I worked for before I started my consulting practice, uh, I was vice president of supply chain, and one of the biggest problems that we had was that we had 4,000 products. 4,000 different chemistries supporting oil field, specialty chemicals, basically production, drilling, and hydraulic fracturing activities. How hard, if you have 23 plants in the U.S., and each of those plants, let's say, averages 15 to 20 vessels, reactors and blend vessels, and you have 4,000 products, do you think you're getting optimal use of each of those vessels every time you're using them? Probably not, All right? So just having a larger mix and, and what, what are some of the reasons? Sales and marketing a lot of times will say, well, the customer says they need this. But what are the implications on profitability? What we learned as we went into segmentation analysis with our marketing and our sales group and our R&D teams was that we had about 400 chemicals that made up 85% of all of our sales and profit. All the rest, 3,600, very minimal profit in most instances, some of, some of which were in the red. And, and others very seldomly used, but we had to stock the raw materials for them. We had to plan for them. We had to stock finished product for them. We had to distribute them. We had to package them. We had to handle them. We had to sub-optimize our use of our blenders. So if, how many of you are any accountants or finance people in here? I never get it. We never have any accountants or finance people in supply chain. Um, so if, if, you, if your blender costs you, let's just use blender as a simple example, $1,000 of depreciation a month, and you only use it half of the time, you only use half of its capacity in that month, you're basically incurring a greater amount of fixed cost on every unit than if you had filled that vessel to the top and you'd say, instead of it being one penny per gallon or one penny per kg, it's two pennies. Well, that doesn't sound like much until you start putting all those other additive costs that are on top of it. And what happens if your competition does it better than you? 
then you're in a lot more trouble, right? So supply chain has competitive implications. And so part of that is I always like to do a demonstration. So I don't do any slides while I'm up here. Um, I, I, like to, I like to get the class involved and, and fun, or my definition of fun anyway. Um, so I guess so I'm gonna need some, and I've, I make myself notes so that I don't have to do the math while I'm up here. Is there an, here it is. Let's, let's start with, I need any entrepreneurs here that want to own their own business? Oh, we got one. You want to be CEO of your own company? All right, come on up. You're now a CEO of a billion dollar company and you also have to have the guts to be a CEO, by the way, so congratulations. What's your name? Walter. Walter, all right. Walter is our CEO. All right, now everybody's hands are gonna be like firmly in their pockets. <laughs> I saw how many people raised their hand before. How many marketing majors are in here? Who wants to be the chief marketing officer of, oh, there we go, we've got our chief operating and marketing officer. All right, so what's your name? Katie. Katie. Welcome to the company, Katie. All right, so uh, several people raised their hand and said they were interested in supply chain. Who wants to be our supply chain, chief supply chain officer? We need, oh, all right, here we go. Wait, uh, wait, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, Andres uh, saves us again, right? Andres, right? Okay, now we need, um, a CFO. Anybody have a minor in finance or accounting? All right, uh, uh, come on up. It takes guts to do this. So, so what's your name? Casey. Casey. Okay. K A C. Uh, K A S E Y. All right, and then. Uh, I think that'll flesh out the organization that we need. Uh, I'm going to be chairman of the board. So everybody here basically has to you know, answer to me at the end of the day, right? You know, but uh, the CEO, I've given you great latitude to be able to run this company because I've got all these other organizations that I need to run. So how many of you love doing financial statements? Everybody raise their hand. Financial statements. All right. How many of you like making money? How many of you are competitive in sports or other things? All right. Would you, how many of you would really appreciate if instead of Sam Houston getting to the playoffs every year in football or going to the NCAA basketball tournament, if everybody got a trophy? Everybody gets a trophy. How many of you competitors really like that? Everybody gets a trophy. Is that the society that we grew up in? It probably is, but uh, is that the society that's really the, the, the real world? Does everybody get to be CEO of a billion dollar company? Does everybody get to make $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 a year? No. What differentiates you? You're getting a trophy because you're putting the effort in and you're winning. Right? So there's, there's wins there. So if you think of a financial statement as opposed to it being this scary document that you non-finance and accounting people are afraid of, think of a financial document as the score. If you're playing basketball, you're going to know how many rebounds, how many, uh, what, whether you went two for eight or eight for 12 or whatever it is that from the line or from three point or from the field altogether, you're gonna know whether or not you had an assist and you're gonna know the final score. The final score doesn't tell the whole question, tell, tell the whole answer, right? If you saw in the, and this is gonna date me, but if you saw in the, in the 90s where the Bulls won 102 to 96 over the Pistons, you'd say, oh, well, that's fine. But you wouldn't know who's the best player. <laughs> Who was the best player on the Bulls back then? MJ, I bet, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Nobody said Judd Bushler or, you know, John Paxson or anything. All right, so we're going to start off, and I need my CFO up here. Where's my CFO? I've, I've written this. All right, CFO, you're going to help me with some numbers. All right, we're going to start with this base case here. I need you to write these down. I'll write the first one, and I'll let you write the rest, right? So base case for our company is this. By the way, I hated financial, finance and accounting when I was in school, and I said, I'm never going to use this crap. I'm going to get out, and I'm going to work in operations or an information system job, and I'm good. And you know what I found out? I better freaking remember this finance and accounting because the three less, least powerful operative words when trying to convince somebody to do something in the world of business is, I think, I feel, I believe. Those work in your relationships at home with your your significant other, your spouse, your kids, they don't work well in the business world. Well, why do you believe that? Why do you think that? What, what are the financial implications of that decision? And if you go, uh, <laughs> you have just lost your ability to sway any decision-making authority. So you need to be able to put into financial terms why what you're suggesting is a good thing. So this is going to be your opportunity to sway that. So what do we start with? We start with revenue, right, or sales at the top. If we're talking about a manufacturing facility, what, what minus revenue equals gross profit? Oh, thank you. Uh, sometimes I don't get that. Cost of goods sold. What are the components of cost of goods sold? Direct material. Direct labor. Overhead. Yeah. Direct labor, and we'll call it plant overhead. I just put PLOH. And then we have operating profit. Oops. So that gets us what? When we get our operating profit revenue, what's our operating profit, also known as? Gross profit, right? What are, what are the elements below the line? Operating What's that? Operating expenses. Yeah, operating expenses. We'll just call it, for simplicity, SG&A, selling general and administrative expenses. All right, then you'd have taxes and stuff. Well, we're going to do pre-tax. So then we're going to say net. Oh, I should have put this over. SG&A and operating income. At the end of the day, what two things matter the most when a, from a shareholder perspective? If you're on the market, what do you care about the most? Huh? Net income. What, net income or, or, whoops, I said operating income. Net income, yep. Net income before taxes. So, uh, Net income and what else? Revenue. revenue. Why do they care about revenue? So we're going to learn about why they care about revenue. What do you think about that? And we're going, to, we're going to find out why they care about and how it relates to this. Revenue is a general indicator of health, not in and of itself, but it's basically saying, are you growing, are you stagnant, or are you declining? All right? So growing can cover a lot of sins, but what doesn't happen forever? Right. Growth. Yes, growth doesn't happen forever. There's going to be periods where you don't. So coming from the oil and gas industry, I can tell you, shh, get on that roller coaster because you're, you're going to be riding it. Um, all right, so CFO, I need you to please fill in these numbers that I have here uh, for the base case to start with, please. So our CFO is the scorekeeper. She, Casey, right? Yeah, Casey is going to make sure that whatever decisions that we make as a business enterprise are indeed good for the enterprise. And so I'm going to need uh, Walter. Walter, you're, you're really, uh, I'm counting on you, man. Yes, We've got this business. <laughs> I've invested a billion dollars. This is in millions. I've invested, a, there's a billion dollars in revenue in this company. I'm trusting you to manage it. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, Walter's going to be on the, on the hot spot. Now we have uh, our 
sales on, on, or no, wait, do I have a sales? No, marketing. <gasps> well, our marketing and sales, we're going to call it. So Katie, yes. you're marketing and sales. All right. Okay. So what is your number one complaint? Come Internally. Oh, internally? Internally. That people are spending too much on us whenever they think that they don't need us. Wow, you are the nicest salesperson I have ever met. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so when sales comes internal, they are typically saying one thing. If you could do this, I could sell more. I'm going to stand here until somebody says something. What was the question again? <laughs> if, if, if the organization can do this, or one function of the organization can do this, I can sell a lot more. Lower my costs. My cost. So I, I need you to help me. It's Katie. Sorry. Katie, what is it? What is it that you want? Your biggest complaint internally is? Tell it to me with passion. I want to hear it. <laughs> uh, you got it. You get, this is a passionate costs job. Are too high. My costs are too high. Who are you directing that towards? Okay. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> we're going to go with finance and CEO. Oh, yeah, I think that's a good place, but actually you're probably not going to do that because they kind of help make sure that your bonus gets there, and you're, you're going to be saying... <laughs> There's somebody in here that this class relates to that's responsible for something that has a great amount of your costs in it. Uh, so, supply chain. So, who are you going to talk say that statement to? Supply chain. All right, wait, wait, well, go ahead and say it. Hey, hey. Your, your supply. Uh, uh. <laughs> it's too high. So, Andres, what is your response to this? And what are those reasons? Um, my material, my suppliers are charging me more. And then for labor, I think they said um, I'm getting skilled workers to do the labor. And overhead, our factory compensates for this. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are so nice. Yeah. Well, you know, my cost could be lower if your demand plan was better. <laughs> Because I wouldn't have to order so much of this stuff and have that, this many materials on here, and I could lower my costs all across the board. I'd have greater leverageability with my suppliers for a smaller number of raw materials. I'd be able to have greater utilization of my assets to lower my plant overhead costs, and my labor would be greater utilized, and maybe I can eliminate overtime or you know, run one less shift or whatever. You guys are killing me. I need a better demand plan. You need to know what your customers are buying, and you need to know it so that you can communicate that to me. Those are real conversations that happen within the business enterprise. And there's a, and I, I call it real. It's not generally contentious. It can be, particularly in times of decline. But in general, it's a healthy discussion because there has to be some pressure to facilitate change. Right? You, know, you, don't, you can't rest on your laurels. So, all right, so this is the base case. So let's take a look at this. Our cost of goods sold here is what? These, the, huh? 667 million. Our operating profit or gross margin or gross profit is? 333 million. SG&A, 210 million. Net income, 123 million. 12.3%. Not bad. Who signs up for that? Uh, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, yeah, give me 12.3 net margins. I like it. Um, okay, uh, so CFO, can you help us with the next uh, iteration of the case? So the next one is going to be, what happens in the case of a business loss? Can you draw that? You don't have to write revenue and all that. You can just write the numbers up there. So the new quarter or the new year has disclosed. And our CFO has given us the score. And what we found is that we had a big loss of business. Some of that was uh, because of a decline in the market, and the other was because we lost a customer. So let's see what the impact to our financials are if we lose $100 million worth of business. So can somebody talk to me from a supply chain perspective? What are the types of things that are headwinds to 
a good supply chain when you lose that amount of business. Entry barriers? Um, maybe, if it's a new product, for example, or a new technology that you're trying to get into. But if you've lost some business, what are you losing? Customer. You've lost a customer and you've lost some volume. Market share. Lost market share, you've lost volume. So here you can see you lost some volume, so you're buying less direct material or perhaps you're buying it at a lesser price because it's combined with a downturn. Your direct labor only goes down negligibly, but what happens to your plant overhead? It stays the same. Because essentially outside of maybe electricity or maybe some water consumption or whatever it is, those are mostly fixed costs. It's depreciation of capital assets, right? Um, so you're, you're gonna have a lot, a lot less sway. So all of a sudden, as a percentage of your sales and a percentage of cost of goods sold, Plant overhead's gone up, direct labor's gone up, and direct material as a percentage of revenue has gone up versus the proportionally from the uh, revenue to uh, direct materials. Operating profit's gone down by a substantial amount, right? SG&A and net income, what's the percent? Did I put a percent? Sorry, right? Totally yeah. No, no, you can just put it on the net income ones, that's fine. Oh, it's supposed to be 900, not 9,000. So it's 900 million instead of a billion. So $100 million loss and doing nothing else in the supply chain, you lose 1.3% of net operating income. Do you think that me as chairman of the board is very happy about that? Do you think the shareholders are going to reward us with additional share buys because we're a profitable, growing, sustainable business entity? Or do you think that there's going to be some emotional selling going on? So, yeah. I mean, there's, that's probably going to be the case, right? So, so this is the in, one instance. Now let's go to the next instance. So there, what's the next one on there? Uh, price concession. Uh, price concession. Let, or actually, let's, can we do that one yeah. last? Let's do, no, let's do price concession. We'll do price concession next. So the next one is going to be price concession. Our CFO is going to show us what the impact of financials are when we give a concession to our customer to retain them rather than lose them. Who in sales and marketing ever wants to lose a customer? Raise your hand. Good, because if you did, you're probably in the wrong profession. Um, and most sales and marketing organizations, particularly the lower levels, how are they greatest in, what's the greatest incentive that they have? What are they, if they have a variable compensation at all, what's it tied to? Sales. Sales. So how would that differ than what the enterprise as a whole and supply chain in particular cares about? <coughs> sure. We care about profitability. If a salesperson is only incentivized on sales, they're in a, their philosophy, and I've seen it, is sell at all costs, sell at all costs, because they're not incentivized based on profit. So even if they sell it for a dollar and it costs a dollar ten, they're still going to get their variable comp on top of it in many instances. Like, so their higher levels, as you get to a district manager and up the sales organization, they are incentivized on profitability, but it kind of give you an, a sense. So when you have a price concession, so let's talk about this. You give a price concession of 500 million, no, that's wrong, 50 million, and you get to your, your uh, direct materials remain the same as in your base case. Everything relates to the base case, but what happens to the percentage of revenue? A huge spike, right? So this is everything else stays the same. And then your gross, in, your, uh, gross profit goes down pretty dramatically in the same way. SG&A expense as a percent goes up because you didn't reduce any headcount there. And look at what happens to your profitability. 7.7%. If you would let the customer go, you'd have $99 million in net profit. By giving them a concession, you have $73 million in profit. If you don't understand finance and accounting, you might do this. 
even though you should have done that, <laughs> right? So, and, and those are some of the conversations that you have to be able to be aware of even within supply chain. So can we do the next one? Yeah, so direct material savings. Yeah, let's do direct material savings. You can do it on that side if you want, yeah. So how many people love saving money? Good, because if you're going to be in supply chain, you better like saving money. That's number one incentive. If the number one incentive for, well, number one incentive is make sure you can get it there to sell it. The secondary incentive is do it really cheap, right, and, and efficiently. You can keep writing. Oh, I get, took the sheet. That, that'll help. Uh -huh. um, but uh, from a, a supply chain perspective, you're greatly incentivized and greatly rewarded for offering a differentially low price or a low cost to allow us to get enhanced margins or enhanced share, right? So uh, when, you t when you think about some of the best supply chains out there, name a great supply chain. Amazon, why are they great? Who said that? Oh, here, our CEO, Walter. Why is our, what, I think it's an indictment of you, Andre. So uh, what, what's, the, what's so great about Amazon? Just they have variety and prices are like, always cheaper. Like just, you know, if you're trying to save money, it might take a little longer for you to get that product, but longer you might save, say, 5 to 10% over 20 percent It depends on what you buy. Anybody familiar with a recent acquisition that Amazon made? Whole Foods. Why, are, why did they acquire Whole Foods? One of the reasons. Distribution. Distribution? What, what was going on with Whole Foods? Their costs were high. Their costs were high. They were losing share because a lot of lower cost competitors were coming into the marketplace. But what were, they were the preeminent brand, and still are, really amongst organic food sales, right? So there are two main reasons that Amazon would acquire that. Number one is there's a huge value in the brand name of Whole Foods. And they have a footprint that can be utilized in a, in a good way, in good locations. The other is, what did they do immediately after they acquired Whole Foods. What's the first thing they did? They lowered the prices. I mean, and they put the pressure on who? Supply chain. They said, we're going to get it there quicker, more cost efficiently, and we're going to be able to pass those savings on to our customers so we can capture more share. We do supply chain better than Whole Foods does. We do supply chain better than all the other retail grocery outlets. So what happened to all the other retail grocery, grocery outlets when it first was announced? Man, double digit stop drops for like a Kroger and you know Safeway and all these because oh crap <laughs> you know all of a sudden now Amazon is playing heavily in a space in which we were traditionally the market leaders right so the, the market responded with a great degree of confidence not only in Amazon's ability to make the brand continuously valuable, but to be able to make it a growth engine for the company. So, and that's going to be predicated on their supply chain. So if we look at a direct material savings, and this is applicable to this example, if you see here, sales stayed the same as our base case, but in this case, we get a substantial cost savings of $52 million um, and, and, cost, and cost reduction. Look at what the gross... Or, or the impact of percentage of revenue goes to. Pretty dramatic, right? Then you look, everything else stays the same, but look at your gross profit. You go to 385 versus 333. Uh, SG&A stays the same, but you got 123 versus 175. I mean, think about that. So a $52 million reduction in material costs versus a $50 million loss of business, you could see a dramatically different story, which you would expect, but to a far more dramatic degree over here, right? So it's pretty impressive. So can you write the last scenario down for us? And then I'm gonna ask my executive team to explain their components of it. Because I've taken your jobs away from you. Oh, the chairman has taken over. I'm micromanaging here. I need to, I need to step back.
We'll start with Casey telling us the story since she's writing it all down. Okay. All right, Casey, explain to us what's happening. Is this on right here? Yes. Um, okay, so like revenue has increased. So basically they spent a little bit more. I think they bought more. Mm -hmm. Higher volume, right? Yep. So they sold more, so they had a higher volume of direct materials and direct labor. And then the overhead stayed the same as it did all the way throughout. Um, it made it a... They bought more, like they sold more, but they bought more. Yep. So they like on compared to the base case, like the operating profit is a little bit higher because they sold more units. Um, and then the expenses, so the selling expenses, those are increased too because there were more. <coughs> and then the net income is yeah, the net income is higher, but it's because like there are more units, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Very good. Okay. Cool. All right. So Walter, what are you thinking of this? Uh, uh, let, let me, let's just focus on this business win. Who are you congratulating here? Uh, everybody. Everybody? Yes. Man, you're, you're so nice. Bonuses you're so nice. And bonuses to everybody. Is there not anybody that you should indict for this? Uh, Why? Why supply chain? Because uh, it saved me a lot of money. It made me a lot of money, too. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, Walter. I'm, I'm, my confidence is shaken. I'm going to have to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what this says to me. First off, Katie, fantastic job. Um, uh, you know, with $10 million in investment here, you brought in a 10x return. I got $100 million in sales for $10 million extra SG&A expense. This is fantastic. I am so happy. Very good job. Thank you very much. Um, keep up the good work. Of course. Yeah. All yeah. of those are lasting customers. Yeah. Yeah, finance, good job on keeping the score for us. We really appreciate it. This number is great. I know you guys have been working hard and doing all this kind of stuff. But Andres, uh, what the hell, man? <laughs> what the hell? I gave you all this extra volume, and you gave me the same percent of material to my revenue? What are your procurement guys doing over there? It's just like, what the hell is <laughs> <laughs> all, all downhill. <laughs> so it's a reasonable question, right? So the more you buy, the more clout you have in the marketplace to influence price. Particularly if you're a large buyer of a particular commodity and you have market clout beyond even your particular industry. So it's a logical question. It's a good question to ask. Now, he could say this was unforecasted demand. So, Andres, if you really want you really to get comp, well, wait a minute. Don't be patting Katie on the back too much. It, her demand plan said it was going to be this. <laughs> so I negotiated all my prices based on that volume, and we ended up buying this. So, I mean, so there are some plausible explanations. But at the end of the day, you would expect, as the more volume and more throughput and more share is captured, that your percentage of cost of goods as a percent of the whole should drop, unless you're having to make a substantial new capital investment in a plant and you know, having to write off the depreciation expenses. Or there's a macroeconomic event, such as Hurricane Harvey that came through and ethylene oxide and uh, you know, was in short supply on the coast or whatever, right? So those are some of the, the outcroppings. But, the number one prevailing theme that supply chain needs to understand, or everybody in this class needs to understand as it pertains to supply chain, is you have immense power. More power than a lot of internal organizationals will even understand, whether it be marketing and sales, R&D, finance in some instances, although finance is typically a good ally. 
operations. All these, organiza all these functional pillars within an organization all feel as though they have a greater a capability of affecting the bottom line. The reality is that they have a greater capability of probably affecting the top line, but more so than anybody else, supply chain has a great opportunity to infect, impact the bottom line, particularly in a base case. So, I mean, the reason I show all these different things, there's different scores. So if you were an investor, and Walter, I'm going to put you on the spot again. You can redeem yourself with me here. Which one of these cases would you want to happen? Congratulations, that is absolutely the right answer. Um, because do you like having more money in your pockets? Or do you like giving more money out? Keeping you like keeping it in your pocket. This gets you the most money in your pocket. So look at direct material savings. What supply chain does, they save $52 million, they get $175 million in uh, uh, net profit. You sell an additional 100 million, everything else stays the same, you only get 147. So you think about that, right? Everybody's talking about oh, sale, 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 sale. It should be profitable sale. And it should be, how do I manage my costs better to be able to make this number better? But it's better than any of the other scenarios, obviously. Um, and this is the worst case scenario of all, right? Get, keeping the same volume, having a price concession, and in this instance, you know, I'd really be all over Andres again because I'd be like, come on, man. It's a downturn. I'm still spending $650 million on, on my raw materials. You've got to help me out, right? You know, so those are some of the things that you'd want to focus on. Does this make some sense to you guys? Does it maybe tie in why finance and accounting might be important? So it's a lot easier to say, in order to support the next $100 million in sales, I need to make an additional capital investment, and here's the return on that investment. Because keep in mind, any financial decision made by a large enterprise organization, and really it should be any organization, would be a return on that investment. If I spend $5 million here, I should expect what in return? Right? Based upon my current demand plan, what we think we're going to sell, what we think is going to happen in the marketplace, and what I can service it by doing, right? So, and what are the implications across the board? This is the only way in any functional pillar that you're probably going to get a lot of traction. But in particular in supply chain, if you're going to say, we need to, we need to get a new material and we need to get this material into this location and it's going to save us this much money, they're going to say, well, what are the implications to the overall supply chain? What are the implications to the bottom line? How do I get a return on that investment? That's going to be a lot of the conversations that take place, and particularly if you're going to say, we need to do route optimization. Let's say you have a transportation group, and you need to do route optimization, or optimize your, your logistics across your entire network. You're going to say, I need a $5 million investment. Okay, well, what's going to be a return on that investment? Well, we anticipate that we're going to lower our freight costs by $25 million. Amazon does that extremely well. Why do they have so many DCs all over the country? And why do they have different modes to, that they're using to deliver? I mean, if you've seen, I don't know, I've seen uh, budget trucks come to my house and drop off Amazon packages. It's not just UPS and FedEx. They, they've become innovative in the way that they manage their supply chain, and they've become very innovative in the way that they distribute product. All that has a financial base case. A supply chain person, and Jeff Bezos, who's the CEO of there, is a financial guy, but he's, he started off as a supply chain guy. And you can see it in the entire way that they operate, right? So this is important stuff. Pay attention in finance accounting. If you didn't and you're already done with most of those things, recognize that in order to advance in your career, you're really going to need to understand those things because you're going to need to be able to back it up with something better than I think, I feel, I believe. And, and this is the facts, all right? So I think that's, uh, that's what I had. Any questions, any thoughts? What do you guys think? Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I show, I'll tell you why I show it this way. It's because if somebody had shown it to me this way when I was in school, I would have paid a lot more attention. Hopefully it resonates with you guys because uh, this is the language of business. If you go to, if you, if you go to Mexico, how many of you go to Mexico? How many of you are bilingual? Wow, a lot of people. Well, I'm not one of them, you know. So, uh, so I go to Mexico and I can say, uno mas cerveza por favor and donde esta el baño. But, you know, outside of that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of problems, right? You know, so the, so the, the, the reality is, is if you don't speak the language of business, and finance and accounting is the language of business, people say every, all, everything's done in English. Actually, math is the common universal language. Finance accounting is the business language that everyone wants to understand. So thank you very much for having me today. It's been fun. And thank you guys. Oh, and I do have something for y'all. I do have something for you guys because you are brave participants in this, uh, in this venture. So you each get a pen. So here you go. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll yeah. pass it around. Oh, you'll I'll pass them around? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Our variable comp plan. Yeah, oh, yep, yep, yep. Yes, no, thank you. All right. Yeah, I can hang around. Yep. So, all right, so that was a wonderful lecture, right? Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Sauer to take a few minutes and kind of address the class. Um, so, most of these students here are the senior level. Okay. Uh, some juniors, and they're graduating within the next year. So as they head into the workforce, what they can be doing right now in the last semester or the year they have left at school, yep. how they could prepare themselves, and, and, the and once they start working, yep. what things that they have, they, they have to keep in mind. No, perfect. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So uh, how many of you guys have LinkedIn accounts? All right. Uh, how many of you actively kind of get on there? start, particularly if you're a, a, a senior. There's a lot of jobs and things that are posted on there. But the bigger piece is when people come and you're going to meet other alums that have come here that are just as passionate at the uni of, of the university as I am, um, and a lot of them are hiring. My previous organization before I started the consulting practice, we had 1,400 people that reported up through my organization. And obviously, I still have a lot of networks and a lot of uh, cloud out there. So when talented students and those that get the endorsement of their professors that are well thought of uh, come to us and ask us if there are job opportunities, our gut inclination is to try and help. So networking is probably the strongest piece of advice I would give to each of you. How many of you are familiar with A&M's network? The Aggie Network. I'm going to tell you, Aggies hire Aggies. Aggies are the most loyal to one another. It's disgusting, you know, because I'm not one. Um, but I've worked with a lot of Aggies, and they see me as Aggie light, I guess, because Sam Houston's just down 30. But, um, but that is the type of network we need to build at Sam Houston. It was never there for me. I'm going to tell you the things that are happening in the College of Business and that are available at the university today are far better than when I was in school, but we have a long way to go. So each one of you, as you're getting out in your careers, need to also invest back in the university to help build you. you know, and, and you're going to say, there are things that I wish the university had done. Man, it would have been so much better, and you're going to find out that other people had that experience at a different university or whatever. Don't complain about it. Make a difference, right? This is a great place, but it's only as good as the alums and the students in which make it up. I'm hugely proud to be amongst you as a fellow Bearcat. But as you're going out in the workforce, there's a couple of other pieces I'd, I'd tell you. Network, make sure that you're dressing always professional and you have a very good vernacular when you're talking to people. I mean, don't, don't get too impersonal, right? Don't, don't, get, don't get too formal, but don't get too, uh, don't, don't use slang. 
be very professional, be, be, be approachable. But the other piece I'd say is be great at something. You want to be as quickly as possible when you go into an organization the best at something. When I went to Texaco, I started at Texaco in the late 90s, and I didn't know anything about the oil and gas industry. Nobody in my family had worked in it. And, um, but I quickly found out that I had the best Excel skills of anybody in that place. And anytime there was an Excel problem, people came to me. And I just kept building and building my Excel skills and my analytical capability. And at some point in time, they said, you know what? This guy can do more than be an analyst. He works hard. He's, an, he's got a few marbles rolling around up there. You know, he comes up with good ideas and can present them in a coherent manner. So be great at something when you first start off. And don't be shy. You know, you, you got to be proud. There's, there's people, and I've seen it, because I've hired a lot of Bearcats in my day. And I've seen it where Bearcats come in, and they're almost... Well, I went to Sam Houston. I could have gone to A&M or UT, but I chose to go. Don't apologize where you came from. <laughs> I went to Sam Houston. I got a quality education. Look at the size of this classroom. I can tell you that if you go to any of these larger institutions, I've gone to Rice and I've talked at uh, A&M before, the huge classrooms, the professors don't even know who the students are. I mean, it's to, you have TAs and you, know, you have a unique experience here. It's a great opportunity for you to learn and be educated. Uh, so always be very proud of where you came from. Focus on always getting better. And as you're looking for a job, not only look and leverage the network, but continuously manage your network. One of the things that I really found is I, about it eight or 10 months ago, I started the practice that I'm doing and uh, my network has been my best friend because it's been what's uh, allowed me to get consulting work for those that, I have, that are associates in my practice and, and myself. And it's been very kind to me. And if I hadn't nurtured that network over the course of time, I wouldn't have had the job opportunities I had over the course of my career because I just kept accelerating in my path um, because I made good friends along the way. And those friends would go somewhere else and say, I want to work with that guy again. You know, and, and, and always make them look good. Make your boss look good. Don't work, be humble about the product that you offer. A lot of the things that happen is uh, the current generation, and I'd tell you Generation X, which I'm a part of, was a lot the same way as, look what I did, look what I did. It's more of, look what we are able to accomplish. And, and let your boss recognize you, right? You know, you don't have to tout your own, toot your own horn except at performance review time. But um, uh, to me, the rest of the time, learn. It's like golf. It, it's, everything's a competition. Everybody's competing out on a golf course in a tournament. But uh, the difference is, is whatever, I don't know, Tiger Woods or uh, 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 Lefty, you know, or whoever does on the course, it, it's, it's you. You're competing against yourself. The final score is what's tallied. But you are competing against yourself. So when you're trying to compete with others for positional things, do the best that you can with the skills and the talents that you've been given and continuously educate yourself and grow. Um, and you can do it. Uh, you have to have a passion for it, though. Uh, so my, my biggest thing, and I'll, I'll end with this, but find something you love doing and do that. So I've been very blessed in my life because when I was growing up, my parents always told me, uh, do what you love and the money will come. And I started off not doing business, and I came back to business with my MBA, and, and I found operations and information systems and supply chain to be a huge passion of mine. And because of that, I put in a lot of extra work and effort and energy that people that had more talent probably than me, maybe more intelligence than me, didn't have the same passion, and my passion took me over the edge. So... Find something you love. If it's supply chain, do it to the best of your ability. Invest your, your, your time, effort, and energy in doing that. If it's something else, if, or if, even if it's in supply chain, but it's a particular industry, find that thing that you love doing and do it. You're going to work a long time. I'm 44 years old now, and I can tell you, so I've been working 20 years or so uh, out in industry, and it's a long time. It's not separated by semesters. It's not, you know, you got to find something that you like to do. And so every move that I've made in my career was always, 
I need to find something I'm passionate about and pursue that. So pursue your passions and you will go as far as you're capable and, and you'll be happier. And that's ultimately more than the money, more than anything else, finding a degree of satisfaction and comfort and, 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 and really happiness is what you want more than anything else. So anyway, but thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Anything else? Uh,